Good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the summative session of the 21-22 season of the Constance Baker Motley Speaker Series on Racial Inequality. My name is Karen DiMiola, and I served as a past president of the Connecticut Bar Association, and I'm currently um, a member of the board of the Connecticut Bar Foundation. This series um, is a collaboration between the Bar Association and the Bar Foundation, and attorney Hood, Judge, Judge Bott and I are thrilled to co-chair. Um, not only this year, but you get to see us again next year. And we look forward to continuing to explore topics related to racial inequality with you next season. Constance Baker Motley was a trailblazing civil rights attorney who became the nation's first African-American female to serve as a federal judge and later chief judge. Judge Motley was born in New Haven, Connecticut and maintained strong connections to Connecticut throughout her life. Unfortunately, like so many um, trailblazers, in particular, so many trailblazers who identify as black women, her story is not known by many people. Certainly it's known to all of us who have participated in the speaker series um, throughout um, the last two years. But it is extremely important, um, and you may have heard this from the Connecticut Bar, um, in particular um, from our Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee, that the power of the narrative the power of storytelling, the power of understanding um, who we are, who our leaders were, um, and our history, not only as a profession, but the individuals who have dedicated their life to social justice and civil rights is extremely important. And tonight, I'm very excited that um, we are joined uh, by Dean Tamiko Brown-Nagan, who is the author of Civil Rights Queen, a Com Civil Rights Queen, which is a, a, a biography of Judge Motley. Tonight, the first 100 attendees will receive a free copy of Dean Brown Nagan's book, um, which um, is amazing um, and powerful and uh, a book that everyone should read. Before we begin tonight, I, I ask that you all view the chat function for the session CLE codes and link to record the codes. We'll be sure that the codes are read aloud and posted in the chat during the presentation. Additionally, at the close of the session, we hope you'll provide feedback on today's presentation using the survey link provided in the chat. I have the privilege of introducing tonight's hosts who serve as co-chairs of the Young Lawyers Section, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, Attorney Hood and Attorney Goldsby. And this session tonight is, is also a collaboration with the Young Lawyers Section DEI Committee, as well as the Connecticut Bar Foundation Fellows. Attorney Goldsby is a skilled trial attorney, passionate about receiving favorable results for her clients. She is currently a senior counsel, senior of counsel at Letizia, Ambrose and Falls, where she handles workers' compensation defense matters. She, has, she is admitted to practice law in Connecticut and federal court. Attorney Goldsby received her JD from the University of Connecticut School of Law and her BA from Bryn Mawr College. Outside of her law practice, Attorney Goldsby is the founder of Black Esquire, where she is on a mission to increase diversity in legal profession and raise the 5% of Black lawyers. Through Black Esquire, Attorney Goldsby is known as the value coach. Attorney Goldsby is also a proud volunteer and is a past president of the George W. Crawford Black Bar Association. Ron Hood is an associate at Olette, Deganus, Gallagher, and Grip in he is a trial and appellate lawyer practicing in the areas of insurance defense, personal injury, and general litigation. He practices throughout Connecticut in state, federal, and tribal courts. He received his JD from Western New England University School of Law in 2015 and his BA in economics from the University of Connecticut in 2010. Ron is the co-chair of the Constance Baker Motley series. He is also co-director of the diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Young Lawyers section for the CBA. He grew up in Brantford and resides in Durham with his wife and rescue dog. Anya and Ron, it is my pleasure to turn this uh, panel over to you. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, that was a wonderful introduction to tonight's uh, program and to Anya and I. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dean Brown-Nagan in just a second, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about her first. Uh, she is the Dean of the Harvard Radcliffe Institute, one of the world's leading centers for interdisciplinary research across the humanities, science, sciences, social sciences, art, and professions. She is also the Daniel P.S. Paul Professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law School and a professor of history at Harvard University. 
an award-winning legal historian and an expert in constitutional law and education law and policy. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Law Institute, and the American Philosophical Society, a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, and a member of the Board of Directors of ProPublica. Brown Nagin has published articles and book chapters on a wide range of topics, including the Supreme, Court equal, Supreme Court's Equal Protection Jurisprudence, Civil Rights Law and History, the Affordable Care Act, and Education Reform. She is a contributing editor to Politico Magazine, as well as a frequent lecturer and media commentator. Brown Nagin's latest book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality, published through Pantheon in 2022, explores the life and times of the pathbreaking lawyer, politician, and judge. Her book, Courage to Dissent, Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement, published by Oxford University Press in 2011, won a 2012 Bancroft Prize in American history, among other honors. In 2019, Brown Nagin was appointed chair of the Presidential Committee on Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery, which is anchored in the Radcliffe Institute. The committee issued a landmark report detailing the university's direct financial and intellectual ties to slavery, which resulted in Harvard's commitment of $100 million to redress harms to descendant communities in the United States and the Caribbean. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Brown Nagin, who is going to read an excerpt from her book, Civil Rights Queen. Thank you, Ron, for that introduction. And thank you to Ron and Anya for being in conversation with me tonight. I also, of course, want to thank the Connecticut Bar Association and the Connecticut uh, Bar uh, Foundation for hosting me this evening. I am going to start my the discussion with a reading from uh, Motley's most famous case, and that was the battle to desegregate the University of Mississippi, or Old Miss. This man has got to be crazy. Thurgood Marshall yelled to Motley in January of 1961. That's your case. Marshall had descended upon Motley's office waving a letter from James Meredith. The missive contained such a preposterous idea that Marshall thought the writer must be out of his mind. I am submitting an application for admission to the University of Mississippi, Meredith wrote, and I am anticipating encountering difficulty with the various agencies here in the state. In view of the brewing trouble, Meredith requested Marshall's legal assistance. After Marshall finished laughing about Meredith's proposal to sue Ole Miss, he washed his hands of the case. Marshall knew Motley had the smarts and the courtroom skills to do the job and he thought gender would be an advantage. The fight to desegregate Ole Miss might get someone killed, but in the context of Mississippi's white supremacist yet chivalrous culture, as Marshall saw it, a black woman would fare better than a black man. Any white supremacist, he opined, would scarcely think twice about murdering a black man, but might hesitate to lynch a black woman. The very idea of a black woman lawyer violently clashed with the worldview of Dugas Shands Esquire, the white male lawyer who defended Ole Miss. Shands refused to address the ink fund lawyer in the customary manner as Mrs. Motley. Instead, he used only indirect references, calling Motley her or she. At one point early on, Motley jumped to her feet in a bid to put an end to the charade. But the tipping point occurred when Shans called her Constance. Motley immediately objected. I would like for Mr. Shans not to call me by my first name, Motley insisted. Henceforth, the lawyer referred to Motley as the New York Counsel. After months of struggle and endless delays, Meredith had had enough. Browbeaten by the white resistance, Meredith wrote to Motley, resigned. I will not attempt to obtain an undergraduate degree from the University of Mississippi, the letter proclaimed. Keenly aware that Motley, who had poured herself into the case, would be disappointed in his decision, Meredith pleaded for understanding. I am human after all, he wrote. Meredith had grown tired of waiting for a deliverance that never came. Life had passed him by. 
His peers had graduated from college, begun careers, and moved on with their lives. In the meantime, he and his family had endured a high cost, literally and figuratively, fighting to integrate the University of Mississippi. Motley was stunned by this message. In order to salvage her case and support her client, she morphed from lawyer to therapist, a role she often played in high stakes civil rights cases. To get a handle on the fraught situation, the pair would talk in Motley's New York City apartment where Meredith could taste freedom. There, Motley cajoled Meredith. She persuaded him that he had gone too far and that too much had been invested in the case by the Inc. Fund and the Federal Court of Appeals to abandon the litigation. Just as Meredith reached his breaking point, support arrived, precisely as Motley had promised. On September 10th, 1962, US Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black intervened, halting any further action preventing James Meredith's matriculation to Old Miss. While in Mississippi, Motley built community with a small band of lawyers and activists who took part in LDF's effort to end Jim Crow in the state. She leaned on Medgar Evers, the NAACP's most prominent operative in Mississippi, who often invited Motley to his home where she enjoyed home-cooked meals and fellowship with Evers, his wife, Merle, and their children. But only one month after Motley left Mississippi for the last time, Medgar Evers was assassinated. It devastated her. Motley couldn't get out of her bed for weeks following the death. She couldn't even bring herself to attend his funeral. Nevertheless, she had left the state victorious. Constance Baker Motley emerged as one of the most respected lawyers in America. A story in the New York Times titled Integration's Advocate captured the professional heights to which Motley had soared. A tall, striking woman with piercing dark eyes is almost always in the courtroom in the eye of the hurricane surrounding the struggle for civil rights in the South. Motley's fight to desegregate Ole Miss brought her public esteem and professional success along with devastating loss and profound pain. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Brown. Uh, we are excited to have you here and thank you for sharing a portion of your book. So I, I don't wanna waste any time. I know we have a lot of attendees that are excited to have you here. And so for some of us that may have not had a chance to read the book yet, and I do say yet because the book is good. So make sure you get one of those free copies if you were one of the first hundred attendees and for everyone else, of course, you can still order the book as well. But would you mind just really giving a brief overview of what Civil Rights Queen is all about? Sure, I'm happy to. I'm so excited to send this book out in the world and at this uh, timely moment. Um, the book is about the life and career and times of Constance Baker Motley, who was uh, an incredible figure uh, in American history, who helped to give us the world um, the, uh, of the civil rights era, who uh, made change that many of us today benefit from. She was a civil rights lawyer and then briefly a politician in New York. And finally, the first black woman appointed to the federal courts. And the book considers each of those three phases of her career, uh, showing the way in which uh, she interacted with other pivotal figures and also through her lawyering, through her efforts in politics and through her work on the bench helped to change this country. Um, and uh, it also seeks to um, consider her as a, a, you know, a parent, uh, as, as a, a spouse, the fullness of her and her personality, her background. And uh, uh, as I said, I, I'm excited to, to publish this work. She should be much better known than she is. Yeah, and uh, that actually leads me to my next question because she is such an amazing, amazing woman and she seems to be missing from a lot of the history books. I know myself personally, I hadn't heard of Constance Baker Motley until I came to Connecticut for law school. And I find that to be uh, a, a little troubling considering all of the amazing things she did. She was a politician, she was a lawyer, a judge, and she made such tremendous impact on the world. So why do you think she's really missing from 
history and maybe just from common knowledge. Mm -hmm. So the, what she's missing from is the, um, the, the knowledge of the, the educated public and the broader public, right? So a lot of lawyers know who Constance Baker Motley is uh, and have known for a while. Certainly those, uh, many of those, I, I should hope, in, in Connecticut and in New York who uh, knew about her growing up and knew of her feats in politics and on the court. Um, and yet why she is missing from the broader um, uh, public's knowledge, I think comes down to gender and race. In Western society, historical significance is uh, accorded to, to men, to males. Um, women don't get their due. And that is true in the civil rights scholarship, just the same as it is in other aspects of history. And so one finds that it's only fairly recently that we have learned more about people like Pauli Murray, our Ella Baker, uh, and Constance Baker Motley, who, all of whom were women in the thick of the struggle for civil rights, for women's rights, uh, and they're people who should be known, A, because to not know them is to, as I uh, write in the introduction to my book, is to commit a kind of historical malpractice. Um, but also these women, of course, um, are important for those whom they visibly represented um, and for all Americans to know about. It's important to appreciate who rebuilt this country um, who, who brought about the civil rights laws uh, that uh, we um, enjoy and benefit from and, and, and love to celebrate? Uh, know, know the history, know whose work, whose labors, whose personal sacrifices um, created uh, this more perfect union. Yeah, I think that's really important uh, to, to point out as well because race and gender obviously is something that impacts us even going forward today. So I'm wondering, is there something that you would say is most important for people to know about Constance Baker Motley, particularly for the younger lawyers that may be watching today, uh, something that might be really pivotal for them to, to really remember Constance Baker Motley for? Well, it should be known that Constance Baker Motley was a part of the legal team that litigated Brown versus Board of Education, commonly understood as the most important 20th century case in constitutional law, the case where the Supreme Court held that uh, mandatory racial segregation in schools was unconstitutional. Um, they should know that she also helped to desegregate higher education in the South. And if I had to point to one more thing, um, of course, it's the judgeship, the way in which she was a barrier breaker um, uh, as the first black woman judge and uh, as, as some who watched the unfolding of the hearings and introduction of uh, our new Associate Justice Katanji Brown Jackson know, she is an inspirational figure um, to Judge Justice Jackson, uh, to people like Kamala Harris, the Vice President, of the United States to Lonnie Guineer, um, to, to many others. And so I, I make that point because I think to know her, um, for, for young lawyers to know her is to be inspired um, about what uh, um, she accomplished and thus what they might be able to accomplish in their careers. I'm gonna jump in here now, um, jump into the book specifically and to go back to uh, your excerpt that you read at the beginning of this session um, regarding Judge Motley's representation of James Meredith, you, you talk about how she was his lawyer, but you, you can tell from that excerpt in, in the conversation that she was also kind of his therapist in a way, uh, especially when he wanted to give up on, on attending university. Do you think that is something that came natural to Judge Motley? Um, you know, why or why not? Are, you know, are there other examples of her having the that sort of uh, something, uh, you know, a, ther a therapeutic relationship with her clients, mm -hmm. the struggles they were going through? Right, good question. What I will say is that 
Judge Motley rose to the occasion. She did what she had to do uh, to support her clients who were under incredible stress. And one of the points that I hope to make through this book is to humanize not only the civil rights lawyers, but the plaintiffs and to show the human toll uh, on these individuals who were fighting, uh, who, were, who were named plaintiffs in these class action cases that resulted in these big wins for, for other individuals. Um, and, and so that's the way I look at it. If you are a, a civil rights lawyer at that time, you um, particularly, I, I would imagine it would be the case for um, uh, a, a woman who might have been viewed as more accessible. Um, she was called upon to, to lend support to her clients and one could think about Charlene Hunter Galt and just a variety of other uh, clients whom she represented, um, standing up for them, making them feel as if they could continue because she could continue. And in that chapter on James Meredith, I do write about how the, the stress uh, and just the physical exhaustion of that case wore on her um, in, a, in a fashion that was similar to what James Meredith um, experienced. And so uh, she, she not only was counseling, she was commiserating with these clients, I would say. Wow. Yeah, and, and, I, and I guess to follow that, you know, it makes me think about the, 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 the relationships that she built with these clients, um, you know, clearly formed friendships with some people. And, and I wonder, um, were there clients that she kept in touch with after the litigation um, or who some of her, her, her favorite clients were um, from her time in, in litigation? Yeah, I don't know that I would characterize any client as a favorite, but she did keep up with James Meredith. He kept up with her. Um, he, he could see during his interactions with her um, that, that she, was, she was on the rise, that she would do amazing things, uh, more amazing things, I should say, in her life. Um, and he kept up with her. She wrote him a letter of recommendation when he applied to Columbia Law School. Um, she also continued to, um, uh, to interact with people like Charlene Hunter Galt. Um, and of course, it's not just the, the clients who are important, it's the camaraderie among the lawyers themselves and the, the community of civil rights activists and lawyers who were fighting together um, uh, to make change. All of that is a really important aspect of the, the book and of the reality and um, pushes back a little against the notion of a gladiator lawyer uh, who, who does it all by himself or herself. Um, this, this was about community um, and the community itself um, girding uh, the individuals as they fought for change. Mm. There's, a, there's another part of your book which I, I found interesting regarding, um, I think it was the first time that she met uh, with Thurgood Marshall. Um, and, and it sort of portrays an aspect of him that I don't, I don't think was widely known or has been seen in many other places, but um, there's an incident when uh, he sort of objectifies her in a way. And um, I know at the time that was probably something very commonplace and maybe not given much thought to, but, uh, you know, to some extent, things like that still happen today. And I'm sure there are uh, lawyers who may be listening that have had experiences like that. So I wonder if you could just tell us about that experience and, and also, you know, how that might have affected Judge Motley and the rest of her career. Hmm. So the, the incident was just uh, uh, Marshall sort of giving Motley the look over and, and, and asking her um, uh, to, you know, climb a step on a ladder so that he could see her figure. Um, as I point out, this is not unusual behavior um, at that time. And as you point out, in, in many cases, may not be unusual behavior today. And yet it, it was important for me to include that story in the book. One, because again, it humanizes these lawyers. And two, it makes the point about how 
what's transgressive here is, is Motley's presence. Um, Motley, a woman, um, coming to Thurgood Marshall and seeking a job as a warrior. Uh, so, so she's in a space where um, the, the lawyers or, or Marshall, others, just she's not expected to be. And that was always the case, essentially, in her career, that she was in spaces where she had not been invited and where um, she, she had to, to blaze a trail. Um, I don't know that I would say it affected her um, throughout her career, because, of course, remember, the point is that this is this is typical in many ways, behavior that women encountered and, and especially um, you know, professional women in contexts like this, uh, you should know that she was always friendly with Thurgood Marshall. They cared about each other. They uh, had great affection for one another. Uh, at the same time, she understood that he was a flawed individual um, and yet she always credited him with having made her career. Um, the, the result of that, that interaction is that he hires her on the spot, um, which is a very different response than she had received from white male lawyers, partners and law firms when she went to apply, who essentially closed the door in her face, which was a similar um, experience. People like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sandra Day O'Connor, um, uh, and so we, we need to keep the whole picture in mind. Yeah, I think um, just as a, a fellow woman, I, I think I could probably resonate with a lot of what you said. It's one of those things, things change with the times, but um, kind of along some of those sort of um, thoughts of sort of maybe how women should act professionally. Um, I'm curious your, if you have any insight on how she handled some of the criticism of sort of her doing this professional work, but maybe bypassing her role as a mother, as a wife, and not doing the traditional things as maybe a, a woman should do at that time. Do you have any sense of how she handled that? Well, oh, I, I uh, first of all, Constance Baker Motley was a terrific mother. She had a very loving marriage. I discuss the marriage in those terms. I do talk about how she was a non-traditional uh, uh, mother in the sense that women were expected to, to work in the home. They weren't expected to travel uh, to, to appear in courtrooms, uh, to have the professional uh, occupational status that Motley had. And so the point that I make in the book is not um, uh, about specific criticisms, but rather it's about cultural and social norms um, and how she understood that she was doing something um, that was different from what was expected of her and that would have included in the workplace. Um, and to give you an example of what I mean, around the same time that the NAACP lawyers were litigating and then relitigating Brown in the Supreme Court, um, Motley was, became pregnant and, um, and uh, gave birth to her, her child, Joel. Uh, and so she was having to juggle parenthood um, in a, in a different way than, than some of those who were in the office with her and virtually all of those, the men who were in the office with her, because of course we don't put the same expectations on mothers uh, or fathers as we do of mothers. And so that's the point that I sought to make in the book. I, I will also say that um, one of the things that's striking, was striking to me is um, that when she reflected on her life with a reporter, um, she said that her most important achievement had been raising her son, uh, that he turned out well, although she did have to travel. She was uh, non-traditional. Uh, and I, I think that you know, that, that uh, reflection is, is revelatory in a number of ways. Yeah. 
I, I always hate that term non-traditional, especially now, because I think there's so many ways and paths to get to a particular point. Uh, so I don't know if it ever really needs to be non-traditional, but she was certainly amazing at what she did either way. So um, I think that's great that you were able to talk more about that. Um, you also talk a little bit about um, her background. She was born in New Haven, but her family immigrated from the Caribbean, Nevis specifically. And so um, I'm curious if you have any sense of how that may have shaped the Baker's family in terms of their conception of Black identity when they came to the U.S.? Sure. Uh, to go back to the question we were just um, engaging, to characterize her as non-traditional is, is not to ascribe any value judgment to that. It's just to say that descriptively, uh, she was not like conventional um, mothers or that she didn't conform to the norms that society put on her. And obviously, uh, I uh, admire the choices that she made and think that that was a a, a good thing um, to, to be unconventional. Now, as to her background, she was uh, born in New Haven to parents who had immigrated from the Caribbean during the early 20th century from Nevis. Um, it was a supportive family, a socially conservative family. Um, and in terms of identity, uh, perhaps one of the most notable aspects of um, her identity formation relates to her father's uh, sense of superiority um, to Black migrants, Black Americans. And so I bring out that theme in my book. It's important to, to do so, to talk about um, intra-group social dynamics. Um, I, I go on to explain that although, and I have had this reaction when I talked about this aspect of her um, identity, some, some people um, are either surprised about it or they think it's, they're uncomfortable with it. Um, it, it was a kind of, it, it gave her a kind of protective armor. Um, that is when she went to the South and uh, she was litigating cases like the Ole Miss case uh, and was disrespected. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a story, one about this lawyer, Dugas Shands, where she saw him in the airport. And although he was odd in court, um, she went up to him and extended her hand uh, because you shake people's hands. That's just common courtesy. courtesy. And uh, he, he didn't shake her hand. And she was just dumbfounded by this because she attended Columbia Law School. She was from a great family. And, and how could he not understand that um, she, she was, if anything, she was the superior individual in that circumstance. And so that's what I mean by um, having been acculturated in a community, in a neighborhood where um, her parents and her community and still the sense of self-worth was really important um, to her all of her life. Um, and uh, I, I was happy to write about that aspect of her experience growing up. Yeah, I think that's really telling as well. Um, someone not shaking your hand, not giving you that respect that you feel like you, you deserve <laughs> and, yeah. and rightfully so. So um, and another question I had was, uh, she obviously made some great history and even just going to law school at a time when she did was a great feat on its own. So I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the pivotal moments along her journey from New Haven uh, before she started at Columbia Law School. Hmm. Well, there are quite a few of them. First, I would stress that she attended integrated schools in New Haven. Uh, went to a fine uh, high school in New Haven where she uh, was, her, her peers were, many of them were uh, immigrants from uh, Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, and in those schools, she found teachers who were supportive of her, could see that she was special, um, who uh, helped her by supplementing her education through uh, you know, teas or 
uh, hiking trips. Um, and some of those teachers exposed her to the writings of people like W.B. Du Bois, James Weldon Johnson, uh, and that was formative for her. Uh, she also grew up in the Great Depression and in a politically active um, uh, context where she could see inequality all around her, this being economic inequality, and that was an important um, uh, set of experiences that set her on a path to law school. Um, she uh, met George Crawford. Uh, in fact, George Crawford was there when she made a, a speech in answer to a question about why Blacks were not using Q House, uh, where she said, well, essentially it's because uh, you know, the, the whites from Yale were we're setting the terms of engagement. And she said that um, in the company of Clarence Blakesley, who was a New Haven contractor who had built Q House, and he was very impressed with her. And uh, as a result, offered to and did subsidize her college uh, and her law school tuition, which she called a fairy tale. Um, and I will mention two other things. She initially went to Fisk University, the historically black college in Nashville. Um, she found some of the interactions along the way to the South, the segregated South, uh, uh, frightening. Um, and this is just the experience of riding on segregated uh, railways. She, after a year, left and uh, matriculated to New York University where she uh, uh, fit in well and had uh, a lot of important social and political interactions um, and uh, from there to Columbia Law School. Well, um, I want to take a quick moment just to remind all our audience that we are going to have a time for uh, audience participation or audience questions. So um, that'll probably be around seven o'clock or so. So if you want to, you can send them through the uh, Q&A function in Zoom or through the chat, which will come directly to Anya and I or, or uh, Dean Brown-Nagan. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, Dean Brown-Nagan, I wanna come back to uh, New Haven um, and I understand you went to Yale Law School and I'm wondering, you know, how much did you know about uh, Judge Motley back then and, you know, what, in what ways maybe did your experience in Connecticut um, influence your, your connection to Judge Motley and, and potentially your book? Well, let's put it this way. What I knew about Judge Motley, I learned on my own. It was not because she was a presence in my law school education um, uh, or because there was an effort made to introduce students to uh, her where she grew up. Um, my deep engagement with the life and career of Constance Baker Motley um, was a result of writing a book about Atlanta and the social and legal history of the civil rights movement, where um, I encountered her because she litigated the Atlanta school desegregation case all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, I was surprised when I wrote about that episode that there was relatively little literature on her at the time. Um, and, I, and I set out to correct the record. And I will say that I hope that uh, now and, and moving forward that both Yale Law School, the city of New Haven, the state of Connecticut will ensure that Motley's memory lives on. And, and, and certainly, if one considers how much the state of Connecticut meant to her, um, uh, it, it would uh, suggest that uh, her, her state and her city should uh, go all out to claim her because she, she loved the state and its people. Oh, I, I, hope, I hope that's a result that we see in the coming years. And I think um, partially through this series, I know a lot of lawyers have just, you know, practicing for however many years and they're just learning of her. So mm -hmm. uh, I think the more people can hear her story and learn about her. I just, I think it's gonna be great for everyone. Um, I wanna go back to uh, her time with the Legal Defense Fund and, and sort of contrast and compare that to 
um, her time in New England, you know, she spent a lot of time in the South and uh, I'm curious what, what her reaction was and what kind of uh, surprises there might have been um, between the differences of the South and, and uh, New England. Mm -hmm. Well, I started to uh, discuss that by mentioning her experience traveling from New Haven to Nashville, where she had to change to the segregated rail car um, and experience segregation in a way that she had not before. It was, it was, she, she was, um, she was, she was unhappy. Um, it was revelatory. One could know that um, that experience exists, but to to actually um, see it up close and personally is a different thing. And it was for her um, uh, when she traveled to Mississippi to Alabama. She experienced the the same kinds of indignities that her clients um, experienced. So she couldn't. Um, stay at white-owned hotels or eat at white-owned restaurants. They tell a story about how she and her colleague, Robert Carter, uh, some will know Judge Carter, um, who was on the Southern District of New York um, court with her. Uh, they worked together. They wanted to buy fruit at a stand, and the proprietor was disrespectful to um, Robert Carter, who was this amazing figure who had served in the army, and Motley was was unhappy, and she had a she wanted to react, but he actually pulled her back and said, "No, it's not worth it." And, and so, just imagine experiencing those kinds of incidents time and time again. Um, and I also want to mention the UGA case because of the great distance between. Athens and Atlanta. She had to travel with her colleagues back and forth every day, um, which was just tiring, exhausting. And so um, the, these were experiences unique to her litigating on behalf of LDF. And yet I also want to say that um, Connecticut was, was not without uh, discrimination. Um, and that's a point that I make in the book. Um, Motley, I think, understandably views it as relatively um, idealistic in, in comparison to the Southern experience, uh, and yet uh, there, was, there was discrimination there as well and, and all over this country. Mm. And I think, you know, to, to build off of uh, that experience, the, the, the dignities and the sort of microaggressions and the, the, the things that she experienced, I, I was surprised also um, about how harrowing her experience was in the South and the, the significant uh, risk to her life that she took on um, and, and how great the concern for safety was, not just for the clients, but for her and, and the, the legal defense lawyers as well. Um, how, did, how did she cope with that? You talk about we talked about, I'm sorry, there's a little back. <laughs> we talked about that earlier, um, about the sort of commiseration in the community that she was with, but I'm wondering how, how else did she cope with, with that threat to her life and uh, how did it impact her work? Hmm. Well, she was a courageous woman and had to be because of the circumstances that I describe in my book where her life was under threat by virtue of advocating for civil rights, particularly in a place like Mississippi. As I read about in that excerpt about um, the Ole Miss case, it was clear to, to everyone that um, uh, you know, pushing against Jim Crow in Mississippi, which had the worst reputation and where civil rights workers were killed, where her friend Megger Evers would be assassinated, was very risky. Um, and she dealt with it in part because uh, there were there was security. There were uh, when she was first in Alabama, there were men guarding her who had weapons and 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 all of those who were involved. Um, but she also had anxiety and fear about those experiences, as anyone would. Uh, and yet the point is that she pressed on. Um, she did her job. She was courageous, uh, and um, she she 
should be understood as having, and all of the lawyers really having great, great courage um, because they were willing to risk themselves um, in the struggle for black freedom. Dean Brown Nagan, I would love to talk a little bit about how do you think Constance Baker Motley felt about the work that she was doing in civil rights? Uh, I know in prior interviews and there's mentions about the fact that she couldn't get a job in the corporate sector, which is what she wanted to do. So here she is working, doing sort of public interest civil rights work. And I'm curious, did she feel any kind of way about having to make a choice of maybe doing work that was meaningful for her, the mission-based work over doing what others may seem as more traditionally successful? Hmm. Um, well, Certainly, she wasn't happy to be denied employment in the most lucrative sector of the legal profession on account of her race or her gender. And yet, as I describe in the book, she was dedicated to this work, that she did have a sense of mission. She enjoyed the work. She knew that she was um, having an impact on the lives of hundreds of of. Uh, individuals, uh, whole groups of people because of her uh, students, black students were able to enter the University of Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama and to attend desegregated schools in Atlanta and Mobile um, and, and other places. And so I, um, I think she, she understood her historical significance uh, and was pleased to have and proud to have played a role um, in, in making civil rights law. And of course, it's because of her um, fame in that role that she became, she came to, atten to the attention of um, President Johnson and others who were looking um, uh, for appointees to the court. And so I, I, I think it's important to appreciate that this generation of black lawyers face discrimination. Um, at the same time, they, they were dedicated to the work that they were doing and, and aren't we happy that they, they were? We definitely are. <laughs> so I wanna talk a little bit about her time on the bench. So I know there was some level of skepticism from the bar and the bench and people that were observing her, I guess, alluded bias, so to speak, on the bench. And I was curious how maybe those characterizations and Judge Motley's actual judicial record, what does that reveal about herself and maybe these broader lines of inquiry about uh, overall judicial behavior? Hmm. I think it probably reveals more about them than, than anything about her, right? So the allegations of liberal bias uh, first of all, reflected um, a sense that she didn't belong on the federal judiciary. No women did, no black people did in the view of, of some of these individuals and certainly no civil rights lawyer did. Uh, and so one finds examples of um, people alleging that she might uh, show bias before when she was nominated uh, throughout her career on the bench, there were motions to asking her to recuse on the basis of bias. Uh, and, and yet there's a the way of seeing this as projecting, right? What, what they, what many of these individuals, and I should be specific, in, in one of the cases, Title VII cases, where a lawyer for Sullivan and Cromwell asked her to recuse um, on the basis that she might be biased what, what the fear is there, I would say, is that she actually would be even-handed, that she would take seriously a claim of discrimination lodged by um, women law students. Um, and uh, the other point that I want to make is that I did both a qualitative and quantitative analysis of Judge Motley's um, uh, cases, outcomes in her cases, and she she was not a a, a particularly uh, liberal judge uh, among liberal judges, right? She doesn't look terribly different uh, from other judges on the Southern District of New York, 
And the reality is that, as the litigators will know, in, say, Title VII cases, it's really hard to win those cases. Um, some of that has to do with the evolving nature of discrimination. A lot of it has to do with Supreme Court and appellate court precedent. And so the, the claims of liberal bias are mostly inaccurate and overblown. Although I do want to say, and we can talk about this if you like, that she also was a pathbreaker in a number of cases um, uh, on her time uh, on the bench, and, and those are important too. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so I know we're getting close on time before we open it up for more questions, but um, what would you say were some of her most influential or important cases that she decided on the bench? Mm -hmm. Well, the Sullivan and Cromwell case uh, where she, um, it, she um, approved a settlement that resulted from um, this lawsuit by women uh, lawyers who claim that the law firm was not hiring women um, as, as their qualifications suggested, was not promoting them um, to partner. That resulted in an important settlement that opened the doors of these prestigious law firms to women um, because there was an affirmative, essentially affirmative action policy uh, put into place. That's an important case. Uh, it's also important because when she received that recusal motion, she wrote a brilliant opinion pushing back uh, against the notion that as a black woman, she couldn't be fair. Um, the, the opinion held that identity alone is not sufficient to establish bias within the meaning uh, of the, the ethics uh, norms and rules. Um, and moreover, she said, all of the judges uh, had a background in experiences, uh, including a practice background. And so um, if, if one were alleging, could allege bias on the basis of those characteristics alone, then no judge could hear um, uh, that particular case and many others. And that opinion has been cited over and over again um, for that very important proposition. The final case I will mention involved Martin Sostre, who was uh, a so-called jailhouse lawyer um, and a, uh, an, an advocate who made tremendous contributions to the field of prisoners' rights through a number of cases, including one that he filed against um, guards uh, who placed him in solitary confinement because he said um, they retaliated um, because he didn't, um, because he was, he was an activist. Um, they would not, they opened his mail. Uh, he didn't have proper communications with his lawyer. She ruled on his behalf, awarded him damages, and it was a very courageous action. She did it because she thought it was the right thing to do. And yet I will tell you that no one outside of the, the prisoner's rights uh, growing bar would have faulted her had she not ruled on his behalf. It was just a, a courageous thing to do and inspired tremendous pushback. So continuing with the, the conversation about her time on the bench, I, I think you touched on earlier some of the, the judges that she was colleagues with or had influence to, but what, what role did Constance Baker Motley play uh, as a mentor to not just other judges, but law clerks and other people that she encountered while on the bench? Mm. Well, this is one of the uh, most important aspects of Motley's legacy that I document in the book, the way in which she had been denied. She didn't have um, uh, the possibility of mentoring in the way um, that she provided to her law clerks, uh, uh, the support she provided to other judges. Um, she was friends with uh, now Justice Sotomayor, who joined the Southern District of New York as Motley was taking senior status, um, to other uh, judges who, women judges who followed her 
Um, her law clerks speak so fondly of her. Um, many, of course, went to work for her because of her, um, her path-breaking status uh, as a civil rights lawyer. Uh, she was, um, she could be intimidating uh, just by reputation. And yet she was, she was so supportive of her clerks. Um, she invited them to her summer home in Connecticut where the rule was that they could talk about anything other than work. And so it was an effort to set them at ease. Uh, she was uh, an important uh, supporter of, of uh, Connie Royster, her niece, uh, who of course is a Connecticut lawyer. Um, and so th there are many people who speak so fondly of, of Motley and the fact that she gave back. Um, she didn't have to do it. Uh, there, there are some people who, who are not so uh, disposed to supporting others, and, and yet she did, and I think it speaks to the kind of person that she was. And that absolutely does, and, and I wonder, could you speak a little more um, about you know, what, who she was as a personality and, and what, her, um, you know, what defined her as a person? There's not really a lot out there about who she was, and, and, and in light of that, how did you get to know her as a person? Mm. I would say I, I for to to write this book, I read every scrap of paper that I could possibly find about Motley. I of course read her autobiography. Um, I talked to her uh, her son and her niece and other relatives, uh, to her some of her law clerks, to colleagues. Um, to get a sense of the person. And I, I meant I used the word intimidating in my prior um, answer. And I think that uh, that characterization, um, that perception is accurate. And yet for those who got to know her, they, they could see she was just such a lovely person um, who cared about her family, cared about her community including her family back and community back in Nevis, um, which she visited uh, often. Um, she was a reserved person. And of course, um, a, a part of what that, that sense that she was foreboding reflects the reality that she wore a mask um, uh, to, I would imagine for a lot of reasons, but to protect herself um, because she needed to. Um, uh, to appear, um, you know, uh, not one to be messed with uh, as she took her seat on the bench and encountered some uh, lawyers who did not know what to make of her or couldn't, had a hard time interacting with her because it so violated their sense of uh, who could be a judge. Um, and so I, I think she was a, she was a strong uh, uh, person a uh, formidable person and a lovely person. Yeah, um, I wanna go back to, to something you mentioned about her summer home in, in Chester, Connecticut, which I, I know she spent a lot of her career all over the country in different places. And you know, a lot of that was in cities and, and sort of urban areas. Um, but that vacation home later became her, her retirement home, if I'm not mistaken. So. What do you think drew her back to Connecticut and, and specifically to a place as rural as, as Chester? Well, I would say the contrast between uh, Chester, Connecticut and a New York City, um, right? It was a respite for her and a place where she could let her hair down. And um, you know, Motley was famously always dressed to the nines. And yet I have photographs of her in Chester when she's clearing brush or um, doing other activities around the house and she's wearing her blue jeans and her Timberlands and it, it's just a, a great um, sight to behold because it, it's a place where she could she could be with her family could be with herself and be away from all of the busyness of life on the court although it's also the case that she she brought work with her um, often and did some of her work during the summer in Chester. It, it's, it was for her a lovely uh, community and I will say judging by 
my interactions with some individuals there who knew her. Um, she loved Chester and the, the people of Chester loved her back. <laughs> That's so great to hear. Um, we're getting close to the point where um, we're gonna take some audience questions. So I just wanna remind everyone to uh, send those through the chat or through the Q&A function. Uh, but I do think Anya has a couple more questions that she wants to get to Dean Brown Nagin. Awesome, thank you, Ron. Yeah, so we do have a few more moments, but I wanted to squeeze in a, a couple questions, uh, really talking about you. Um, you mentioned that you spent about 10 years writing this book. So I'm curious how the experience was for you to write this book, to be ingrained in so much information and literature and talking to so many people about her and, and sort of what the journey was for you over those oh. past 10 years. Sure. Uh, interesting question. Writing a biography is a different kind of endeavor. It does require immersing oneself in the life of another. Um, and I will say that um, I, I certainly wanted to do just the very best job that I could um, because I uh, think so highly of Motley and feel so strongly about um, uh, the importance of as many people as possible knowing her legacy. And so the time that I took with the project reflects a, a care um, for, for the subject. Um, Motley was inspiring, um, including because there, there are aspects of my background that, um, that uh, are reflected in hers growing up in, a, a, in humble circumstances. Um, and uh, being able to uh, pursue an education and, and be supportive, uh, supported um, in a way that is just uh, sort of dreamy. Um, and, and of course, the, the activism, the lawyering of Constance Baker Motley is all bound up with my own life story. And so um, uh, she's an inspiring figure. I was happy to learn um, about the breadth and depth of her legacy. Uh, and also was happy to, to, to finish this book, uh, which I managed to do while deaning, um, which is a very hard thing to do. Uh, and yet I was determined to do it. And uh, I'm just very pleased um, to, to have, um, to, to be associated with this individual uh, and to have, uh, but yeah, I poured myself into this project and uh, judging by the reception, I think um, that uh, I, I did I did an okay job with it. I think you did more than okay. <laughs> uh, and you certainly did pour yourself in this book. So, you know, last question I have would be, if you had the chance to speak to Constance Baker Motley yourself, what would you say to her? Hmm. If I had... The chance to speak to her. Um, this is a question I haven't I haven't gotten before. I probably would um, ask her uh, about some figures that she overlapped with. Um, I would ask her about Malcolm X. Um, I would ask her more about Martin Luther King Jr., Ella Baker, Holly Murray. Um, these splendid figures, but I also would just ask her about um, to, to reflect on her journey um, and um, it, in particular, the perennial work life balance question. Um, I, I would enjoy talking to her and, and only regret that I, um, I started this project uh, uh, after I, I was working in the same courthouse as, as Judge Motley, working for Judge Carter, actually. And so I, I was not able to speak with her about her life. And um, I, I, would, I would enjoy that kind of conversation, of course. Well, I think we're gonna go into some audience questions now. And the first one, I I admit, I partially know the answer to already, but I want to put it to you, Dean Brown Nagin, to see if there's any others. But the question is, uh, do you envision the production of a documentary about Judge Baker Motley similar to 
um, a film being produced about Justice Bader Ginsburg. And I'll note, I'll note that our, our intro series for this year of, of the Constance Baker Motley series was a showing of the trials of Constance Baker Motley, which was produced in part um, by her son, Joel Motley. Uh, and, I, and I think that is available online, but I don't know of any other documentaries. Do you? Um, I will say that I, I am talking to some people about the possibility of um, uh, a, a documentary related to my book, which I would, would be happy to pursue. Um, I, having said that, I, I think The Trials is a moving um, uh, documentary and tribute by Joel to his mother. Um, uh, so I, I will I will stop there. I, I would love for there to be many productions um, mm -hmm. uh, about Motley. I, I think she deserves that. I, I absolutely agree. And, and I'll ask too, and along those same lines, another question we had was, um, do you know of any substantive efforts to make her story part of um, more K, common uh, K-12 curriculum? Um, hmm. If not, what, what do you think we could do to um, try to make that a reality? Hmm. Well, I uh, am happy to report that um, uh, C-SPAN has created a curriculum around uh, Judge Motley that in part reflects uh, my work and um, I, I and it's it's a curriculum for K through 12 students and I'm happy to see that. The way these kinds of things work is uh, they build upon one another. So the fact that that's out there, I think um, will be of interest to people who are in charge of creating um, uh, curriculum for these students. Uh, and if things like, you know, it, it, it documentary, another documentary are distributed, that will help. Um, uh, and and I, I expect that in the coming years, we will have greater inclusion of her story in the American story as we should. Mm. Oh, that'll be great. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to uh, some some a question that we have about um, Judge Motley's work at the LDF, and, and you talked about um, and we know about a lot of the, the cases that she worked on that were focused on education. The question from the audience is: um, Did she work on other cases that weren't directly related to education, and what what were those? Mm. She worked on a little bit of everything. Um, as I discuss in the book, she handled cases for um, black veterans who were subject to court martial. She worked in housing cases. In fact, she was an expert on housing cases within the Inc. Fund. Um, she represented criminal defendants. Um, she represented civil rights activists. Um, so there, there are a range of cases that she worked on in addition to the very important education cases. Hmm. Um, and one more question about the, her time at the LDF. Uh, we know that when, when uh, Justice Marshall uh, left and, and there was a, uh, an opportunity to be the successor, um, that, that, that wasn't her. And uh, how did that, um, was that something that she really wanted? What, what, how did that, that decision uh, sort of passing her up, how did that affect her? Did she feel oh. I do tell the story about that incident. She certainly thought that she was a qualified candidate, um, as did uh, a number of prominent Black lawyers, including Bob Carter. Um, she was disappointed that she did not receive that position. And yet she understood that it would have been truly pathbreaking had uh, she been chosen for the position. She um, would have been uh, you know, the only woman heading an organization of such importance. For instance, there, you know, there was no woman heading the ACLU uh, as a comparison. Um, she thought that Thurgood Marshall did not have the imagination um, uh, to, to have a woman in that position. Um, 
she she was given a title. She was the number two uh, in the office. And I should say that she worked. She had worked for a long time alongside Jack Greenberg and continued to work with him. Um, he was a terrific lawyer um, and uh, by all accounts did a great job at the Ink Fund. And I should say the point of talking about that incident is not to say that um, she should have or should not have been chosen. It's to tell her story um, and to include the lens of gender as a category of analysis of her story and of the history. Um, and the final thing I'll say about that is, um, of course, one could say that the setback became an opportunity for her because it wasn't long after she experienced that professional setback that she um, uh, entered politics and uh, first in the New York Senate and then as Manhattan borough president. And uh, ultimately she had this capstone uh, career as a judge. And so it, it, it worked out. It definitely did. Um, and actually the, the next question uh, that came up was uh, really just to talk more about how she made it to the federal bench, particularly at a time when discrimination and racism was really the norm at the time. Um, so what was her formula? How did she get there? Hmm. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a formula. She was noticed by President Johnson and his administration because of the work that she did. Um, my slide deck included that article from New York Times um, noting her contributions to the civil rights movement, um, how she was a legal architect and a tremendously successful litigator. And that is how she became known um, and what commended her to Johnson and others. Um, and so her, her formula was, was excellence in her career. Um, at the same time, I believe the, the point that you're making is that nevertheless, um, it was the case that women and people of color were um, not frequently appointed to the federal bench. Um, of course, Johnson wanted to make his mark. He was competing in part with the Kennedys always. Uh, the, the uh, President Kennedy um, was said to be supportive of civil rights, but actually appointed a number of segregationist judges to the bench. Johnson wanted to do better, to have a legacy in support of the Black freedom struggle. And he was able to do that by appointing Motley um, to the bench. Marshall um, was a uh, uh, promoted, uh, became a justice of the Supreme Court. Um, and so um, that, that, is, that is how it happened and not without controversy. As I mentioned before, um, there were those who, who, who opposed her nomination or were skeptical of her appointment as to the Second Circuit, which is the court that Johnson originally wanted her to sit on, she was appointed to the district court. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased that she was able to uh, trail uh, Blaze in that way. And yet it, it was not an easy, it was not an easy um, nomination process for her. She had to wait for seven, seven months because of pushback by Senator Eastland of Mississippi. Yeah, that's seven months is a very long time to wait. So I couldn't imagine what it was like to experience for her. And as we know now, we have uh, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson on the US Supreme Court. So we have a question that um, asked if you can talk more about the journey of Judge Motley. Um, and it took for uh, sort of that relative historical obscurity and hidden figure status to this public awareness because potentially of Katanji Brown Jackson's nomination. Why did it take so long? Was this not an accident of history? Hmm. Um, I, I prefer to see it as divine intervention. Uh, the confluence of uh, Associate Justice Jackson lifting up Motley as a role model, um, the publication of my book around the same time, the same week that Justice Breyer announced that he was stepping down. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a terrific 
um, a set of uh, circumstances that are yielding more prominence, resulting in more prominence for Judge Motley. And um, I, I'm, I'm happy about that. At, you know, the, the fact that she hasn't received her due until now, at least in the broader public, as I said, reflects the politics of, of race and gender um, as embedded in scholarship um, and in writing. And isn't it great to be able to correct that wrong? It definitely is. I'm, I'm curious if you think that uh, Constance Baker Motley really opened doors for someone like uh, Justice Ketanji Brown, you know, to, to, to go on the Supreme Court, stepping behind someone like Constance Baker Motley. Would that have been possible if someone like her wasn't first on the bench? Well, no, uh, she, she definitely paved the way for uh, Justice Sotomayor, for women who were appointed to lower courts, and most definitely for Associate Justice Jackson in any number of ways. Um, I, I, I mentioned that as a, um, as a Black woman uh, lawyer, Motley paved the way for me. Um, uh, and, and that's true of, of, of all of us, of a wide swath of us, and particularly those who are, who have been appointed to the bench. Yeah, and so just for anyone that doesn't know the statistics right now, less than 2% of Black women are, are U.S. lawyers, and so the, the numbers are obviously better than they used to be, but they are still quite low, and so I, I personally look up to someone like Constance Baker Motley for what she's been able to do in the field of law. Um, so we have another question that wants to talk a little bit more about uh, the pushback that she received from the courts where she practiced. So they ask, how frequent were these attempts to push back and did any of these attempts pushbacks result in any threatened or actual discipline suspensions or attempts to disbar her? Um, no, um, in terms of the frequency as to suspensions, disbarment, no, she had a terrific professional uh, reputation. Uh, maybe the question is about suspensions of lawyers who are pushing back, I'm not sure. Um, I, I will say that the, mostly she was, you know, she, she held her own obviously on the bench and most lawyers were respectful. Um, some were awed by her and so happy to practice in her courtroom. Um, but the examples of those who did push back loom large, um, and, but, but they, it wasn't the norm. And, and yet I thought it important to write about those incidents because it's true, it's, it's history. Um, but also I think so that others can appreciate that no matter the, the stature um, or status of this individual, she was on the receiving end of pushback. She handled it, um, but it's important to know um, about those incidents, those tribulations, and also to know that she held her head high um, and uh, just had such significant achievements on the bench, just as she had in politics and as a practicing lawyer. So one other question asked about just lessons that we can get from her life and her career um, as attorneys today. What sort of things do you think we should take away from Constance Baker Motley? Hmm. Well, the importance of service, um, just to flip that that conversation that we were having about whether she felt at a disadvantage because she couldn't go into, um, she wasn't hired by private firms. Well, of course, there, there's, um, there's greater opportunity today um, for black lawyers and women lawyers. And um, I, I should hope that her example and her sacrifices for us uh, suggest to others the need to give back to communities, um, whether it's by practicing as a public interest lawyer or 
pro bono or whatever the case may be, do something um, to help other people as a lesson. Um, also, I think her life um, suggests that we ought to have the courage of our convictions. As I was speaking about the case involving the prison litigation, Molly did not have to rule in that way. And yet she did it because she thought it was the right thing to do. And um, as we encounter um, trials and tribulations in our practice lives or uh, situations that demand courage, we ought to, we ought to have courage, um, to have greater courage. Um, and the other thing I will say is one of the just terrific things about Motley is how um, she was, she, she just did the work um, without a lot of fuss. Uh, she was, she was not dramatic. Um, she, she was, you know, hardworking, dedicated, and I think she just had a great personal style and way of moving through the world that I personally find commendable and, and that I, I think um, sometimes there is a focus on and a, and a um, desire to have a certain flair or drama. And there are lots of different models of effectiveness professionally and certainly uh, Motley's model of uh, a, a more quiet charisma um, and effectiveness is a really important one. Yeah, I, I think that's actually something we could all learn from. You know, there's something sometimes I think in just being excellent and letting others just see it because it speaks for itself sometimes. We have just a couple more questions, I think. Um, one of them being, you know, in light of all Judge Motley's accomplishments, both as a lawyer and as a judge and, and, and throughout her, her, her life and career, um, what do you think gave her the most pride, satisfaction, or, or happiness of all her accomplishments? Hmm. Well, she accomplished quite a lot, and so there, there's much to choose from. I, I think that she was pleased and proud to be an historic figure who had helped to bring about the second reconstruction. At the same time, as I mentioned before, she was proud of her family her family life and of being a mother, um, raising a, a son who uh, also is, is dedicated to, um, the, to, to service. Um, uh, so, so those two things, so a balance of her professional achievements in a variety of ways and her family life. Thank you. And I think as a sort of a follow-up to that, um, did she have any regrets or, or do you know of any regrets that she had? Uh, she, I don't think she's the kind of person who, who sort of had regrets. Mm -hmm. um, she did what she did. And uh, I don't think there, I can't imagine what she would have regretted. Um, she, she achieved so much. She did such great work on behalf of humanity um, and I will say, given what I know of her personality, if she did regret, have regrets, I don't think she was sharing it with a lot of people. <laughs> I, I agree. Well, I think we're going to wrap up there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to talk about um, civil rights queen and Judge Constance Baker Motley. Um, this has been a real privilege and an honor. So thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank you. Um, well, we have one more, oh, another question from the, oh no, uh, uh, some praise from the audience, not another question, but uh, I think everyone here appreciates um, what you've done in putting this book together and, and, and being here. So I, I wanna thank, oh, I'm sorry, would you like to? I just wanna say thank you for having me. I've enjoyed the conversation and um, appreciate the, the attention to the subject and, and to the book. Thank you so much. So thank everyone for, for joining us tonight. Um, I also want to thank our, our speakers, um, uh, for everyone for sharing uh, their knowledge and expertise for the great questions we had from the audience. Thank you to the Connecticut Bar Association and the Connecticut Bar Foundation for their continued collaboration in holding this speaker series. 
Um, you can follow the CBA and the CBF communications for more information about upcoming uh, events and, and programs in the Constance Baker Motley series. Um, there's more information in the uh, websites for both of those organizations. And um, thank you both. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Dean Brown-Nagan. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, have a wonderful night. Good night.